My text for this morning is coming from the first book of, of God's Word, from the book of Genesis, and, and I'll read in the 12th chapters the first few verses of that for you. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I'll show you, and I'll make of you a great nation, and I'll bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all the possessions that they had gathered, and, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abraham passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Morah. <clears throat> at, that, at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and, and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord. And he called upon the name of the Lord. Heavenly Father, we read this morning about a 75-year-old who started on a journey at a time when most of us are wanting to camp out and, and settle down and call it a day, indeed call it a life. Watching the sunset, not the sunrise. And God speaks to Abraham. It has come. Let's journey together. I want you, I want you to go on a, on a highway and I'm not going to tell you where it's going, except I'm going to be, with, be there with you. And Lord, we come this morning as, as folks who are on a journey. We don't think about it that way, but we're journeying from, from birth to death. And we take all kind of twists and turns and follow our way more often than your way. Forgive us, Lord, and speak to us from your word. Say a word into, into, our, into our lives. Let our hearts beat with, with the knowledge of your love for us, that we've been chosen just as Abraham was chosen. Let our minds grasp the fact that you have a purpose for us and that this time is not to be squandered. Come, Lord Jesus. Speak to us from your word of your living word. In your name we do pray it. Amen and, and amen. You know, there are all kinds of things that folks are thinking about these days. But there's some big words that, that I have in mind that seem to, to catch where, where most people are today. Anticipation and apprehension. Dreams and dreads, conflicting emotions, and they seem to be everywhere in the, as we are dealing with this coronavirus and all the uncertainties that are, that are about that. We, we want to think positive things, but, but we know there's this other side of it too. There's this great unknown that, that we're standing in, in fear of, anticipation and apprehension, dreams and, and dreads. We all have a bit of both of those mixed emotions as we start this new year. As unlikely as it might seem, I believe that Abraham had those same mixed emotions as he began not a, a new year, but a new way of life at the age of 75. God has spoken to him. And in response to God's call, Abraham was was packing his bags and he was leaving his home. He was moving out. And he wasn't just moving from Hilton Head to Bluffton. No, this was the journey of a, of a lifetime. And Abraham was beginning this journey at an age when most of us are, are, are settling down. He was beginning this journey and, and it wasn't familiar territory. He was going into previously unknown territory uh, amongst unfamiliar people and unpredictable circumstances. All those things that we don't like. He was responding to God's call and headed right that way. 
And as he did, Abraham became a pilgrim in the truest meaning of that word. His faith in God sustained him throughout his travels. And his travels became the essence of his life. My friends, as we begin this this new year, I believe it would be helpful for, for all of us to see ourselves as pilgrims. And by that word pilgrim, I mean those who journey through life utterly dependent on the Lord God Almighty. That's what a pilgrim is. It's a holy journey, totally dependent on the Lord God Almighty for His provision, for His protection, for His, for his presence. And we have to travel that way as pilgrims because I believe in, in this year that's now commencing in 2021, I believe that, that much of our journey this year is going to be devoid of those, of those familiar touchstones that we've had. That many of the, the routines that gave us comfort are not going to be there this year in the sense of this unknown. There's little doubt, my friends, that, that in the coming months, our life together will be transformed as we adapt to this ever-changing landscape, unpredictable landscape of of post-COVID Christendom. And I believe it's a landscape that's going to prove every bit as unknown and unfamiliar and unpredictable as anything that Abraham ever encountered on his journey through this world. In fact, I believe only God knows what's ahead for us. Only God. We might think we got a lot going for ourselves, and we might think we have some kind of power to, to predict what tomorrow and, and the next month and the next five months are going to look like, but only God knows that. As we travel through this year, we have only our faith in God to sustain us. That's it. And because that's what makes pilgrims pilgrims, I believe the pilgrim analogy is important today, and, and I believe that the story of Abraham is, is on point so let's, let's dig into that, looking at Abraham. And as we look at Abraham, I want you to look at, look at yourselves. As we talk about Abraham's journey, I want you to think about, about your life's journey, what it has been, what it is, indeed, what it could be. So don't be first of all, that, that, that Abraham was always a pilgrim on a journey. He never settled anywhere. If you, if you take out a, a map of the ancient Bible lands, and you work through the book of Genesis, and you plot Abraham's journeys, his life on there, you'll see he's always moving. He's always on the go. In fact, the the only piece of land that Abraham ever bought was a cave. And he bought that cave near the end of his life. He bought it as a place where he and his family would be buried. In my study of scriptures, I've I've determined that that there's always movement involved if we're to do what God wants us to do. There's always movement involved. Now, I know that flies in the face of what many of y'all hope for. So many people these days have have dreamt the same kind of dreams that people always have. They they dream of that place that they can settle down, a place they can call their their own, that house with the white picket fence and the flowers and, and all the rest of it. They dream of that time when, when they're not having to work for the man and they're retired and they can, they can develop their own routines and they can have that routine in a way that comforts them, just like, a, just like an old robe and a pair of slippers. See, they want to they settle into something. But see, here's the critical fact that, that all, all pilgrims have to keep in mind, see. The security that God offers is in faith in Him. It's not in the world that we create for ourselves. It's not in our status quo. God's security comes in trusting in Him and having faith in Him. And see, God's forever on the move, and and He wants us to show that we trust Him by moving with Him to accomplish His kingdom purposes. Friends, God's always challenging us. He's always stretching us to reach and to, and to risk the promised land for Abraham, and indeed the promised land for us is always out there. It's always beyond us. And only God knows where. Only God knows where. 
when Jesus called Andrew and Peter to, to follow him. He said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Now, what Jesus was asking those fellows to do was to follow his lead. And, and he doesn't tell them where they're going. He doesn't tell them any of his plans. The only promise he gives them is, I want you to follow me. And if you follow me, I'm going to take you on a journey of change. I'm going to take you on a journey of transforming the likes of which you've, you've never even envisioned. You're fishers of fish, but I'm going to make you fishers of men. That's the promise, see? That's the promise. Friends, friends, when we walk with God, movement is always present. Now, sometimes that movement's physical movement. Sometimes it's physical. But always when you follow God, there's movement spiritually involved. There's always change. There's always growth. There's always transformation taking place. And we, when we refuse to change, when we refuse to, to grow, when we refuse to move, you know what happens? God leaves us behind. A historian wrote this about 17th century imperial Spain. He said, at a time when, when the face of Europe was altering more rapidly than ever before, the country that had once been its leading power proved to be lacking in the essential ingredient for survival, the willingness to change. Hear it, friends? The essential ingredient for survival is the willingness to change. That's true of countries, true of people, true of churches. And I believe it's going to be especially true for us in, in this year of, of 2021. The essential ingredient for survival is the willingness to change. In the year ahead, all of us are going to have to be willing to surrender our memories. Think about that. We've got to be willing to surrender our memories if we're going to grow and, and change in ways that are going to honor God during this next leg of, of our journey with Him. As the good book clearly reveals, Abraham was, was always moving. He was always adapted. And, and because he allowed himself to be shaped by his journey with God, God was faithful to his faithful pilgrim. Note with me, secondly, that, that Abraham was an imperfect pilgrim. An imperfect pilgrim. Like most of us, Abraham was a mixture of the good and the bad, and the indifferent, and the selfish. You see, friends, the truth is that we have within us the capacity for the heroic. We can rise to the greatest of heights. But at the same time, we have within us the capacity for the, the, capacity for the sorry and the sordid. And we can sink to the deepest depths. There are times, I can speak for myself, maybe you can relate to it, there, there are times when, when it seems like parts of me have not yet been touched by the power of God's gospel. As parts of me are revealed that, that I'm ashamed of, see. We're all imperfect pilgrims, but thank God for His amazing grace. Isn't it amazing that God is able and he's willing to take us where we are, as we are, in all of our imperfections, and then move us on this journey in which he's transforming us and changing us more nearly into who he created us to be so that we can do what he created us to do. Isn't that amazing? And here's another amazing fact. God always makes the first move. God always makes the first move. Think about it. As you read that Genesis account of, of, of Abraham's life, it's perfectly clear right from the outset that God comes to Abraham out of a clear blue sky. He does not see it coming. At the time, Abraham was an idol-worshiping Aramean 
with all the weaknesses and all the limitations that you and I both have, that's what he was. And like everyone else in history at that time, he, he did not know anything about the Lord. In fact, he did not even know that God existed. Nobody did. And yet, for reasons known only to the Almighty, God sees Abraham amongst all the people on the earth. And he chooses to start a relationship with him. He asks Abraham to go, and, and by faith, Abraham went. My friends, true faith, I don't want you to miss this now, True faith is never anything other than the response of an imperfect human being, you and me. True faith is nothing anything more than, than the response of an imperfect human being to the initiative of God making himself known. Abraham is an imperfect human being. He responds to God taking the initiative and speaking to him and calling him out out of all of humanity, you see, out of all of humanity. Faith never takes the first step. Never. Now think about that a minute. Your Christian faith began when you responded to God's initiative in Jesus Christ. That's when your journey began. God took the first step. While we were still sinners, what did he do? He sent his son to show his great love for us by dying for you and me. God took the initiative. Abraham responded when God took the initiative. Have you responded? Have you? A true faith is that, see? Abraham was asked to give, to give all himself in obedience to God. And Jesus, Jesus asks us for nothing less and nothing more. Know with me thirdly that Abraham was an imperfect pilgrim in search of a promise. An imperfect pilgrim in search of a promise. On March the 6th of 1971, I made some profound life-changing promises to Becky. Some things never change. You know? <laughs> what can I say? One of the people after the service earlier today asked who was in the picture with Becky. <laughs> An another friend asked me if I'd Photoshop that. <laughs> it's a cold group around here now, I'm telling you. <laughs> Made some promises to Becky. Promised to take her as, as my wife. To have and to hold from from that day forward, see, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, forsaking all others until we're parted by death. Becky made those same promises to me. See? We trusted each other's promises because we trusted each other. And that trust has been the, the abiding foundation for, of our love for 50 years now. See? Am I worthy of Becky's love? Surely not. See? It's a gift. It's a gift. See? And here's the thing. As wonderful as her love is, for me, it, it pales in comparison to God's love for me, see? And I believe Abraham felt, a, felt the same way, see? Abraham's faith was founded on the personal love that God had, cho had shown him in choosing him to walk together. That's how he knew God loved him, see? The God of, of Abraham was the God and Father of our of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ who loved me and loved you so much that he hung on Calvary's cross for us, that his body was broken there and his blood was shed there. 
to take away the penalty for your sins and, and mine. My faith is founded on that personal love that Jesus has for me. See? And my faith in God grows. It grows more and more each day. And I say that because each day I get more and more in touch with my own shortcomings and my own imperfections. And, and so I get more in touch with God's inexplicable love. How in the world could he love me? Time and time over the years, I've counseled with people who just struggle with the idea that, that God could possibly love them because down deep, they know what they've done. They know all the things they've done that they shouldn't do. They know all the things that they didn't do that they should have done. And they, they don't think they're, they're worthy of God's love. They can't believe God loves them. And I've counseled with folks over the years who, who believe that all their sufferings all their troubles are caused by God punishing them. God wanting to, to pop it to them because of their, their disobedience or, or their lack of faith. Or, and they, they believe God's going to keep on punishing them until somehow or another they make things right. And then others that I've, I've worked with over the years spend their days trying to do all the things that good Christians ought to do, see? Because they come from that mindset, they, they believe if they, if they work hard enough that they can earn God's love. But the consistent factor about all those different kinds of people is that their faith comes and goes, it, it rises and falls, it, it, it ebbs and, and flows, you know, based upon their feelings, based upon their feelings. And why is it based upon their feelings? Because they do not trust God's promises. Listen, friends. God's love for us is not conditional on our behavior. Let that soak in. If you want to get a tattoo, that will be a good one right there. Don't get a tattoo. God's love for us is not conditional on our behavior. God's love for us is a promise rooted in his character. Simply put, God created us because he loves us. And he loves us because he created us. See? There's nothing in us that is worthy of God's love. Nothing. See? He loves us because he has chosen to love us. And he doesn't change. Here's God's promise to his, to his pilgrims. He says, I've loved you with a sometimey love. I've loved you with a, a love that comes and goes. I've loved you with a conditional love. I've loved you if you do things that please me and I'll quit loving you if you don't. See, it doesn't say that, does it? I have loved you with what? An ever Lasting, ever, that's a long time, isn't it? That's forever. I have loved you with an everlasting love. And because I love you with an everlasting love, my faithfulness to you will continue for eternity. Friends, that's a, that's a promise, see? That's a promise. Friends, all of life is a, is a gift from God. It's a sign of God's love for you. It's a sign of God's gracious provision that's there for you. And we need to give God ongoing and repeated thanks for that. Abraham understood God's provision, understood God's love for him, and because he did, early in his travels, he built an altar at a place called Bethel. And there, he worshiped the Lord. And if you read the story of Abraham's life, you see that, that over and over again, he kept going back to Bethel. He kept going back to that altar. He kept going back to that place of prayer, that place of praise, that place of, of thanksgiving. And folks, I am convinced that, that the number one priority for you, if you want to walk with the Lord this year, 
then your number one priority has got to be meeting regularly with him. Coming to worship, being online, Bible studies, saying your prayers, spending time with the Lord. Spending time with all kinds of things. You're being bombarded by ideas and stuff from every which way. Getting God's word. Soaking the truth. Meet with him regularly. Though Abraham was a man of substance and, and means, God was always at the center of his life. Always there. See? He was always that pilgrim walking by faith. And I suspect that, that there at that altar, the deepest fundamental needs of Abraham's life were met. Right there at that altar. Right there on his knees. Or right there standing with his hands raised. That was the, the model for prayer back in those days. Standing before the Lord. Humbling himself. Opening himself to God's word. See? And I, I believe that probably there at that altar that Abraham might well have discerned a truth that Jesus proclaimed 2,000 years later. He might well have discerned there that, that God's like a vine and we're like branches coming off the vine. And if we get ourselves separated from that vine, we'll have no source of nourishment will wither and die, will never be able to do anything on our own apart from God. See, Abraham abided in God, stuck to him, walked with him. And so should we, my friends, so should we. I hope you're here today because, because like Abraham, you realize that, that God's the key to your life. That staying attached there is, is the key to it. And that you don't have any strength to continue your pilgrim journey with, without faith in him. Now note that last sentence. I hope you're here today because you realize God is the key to life. And you cannot continue your pilgrim journey without faith in him. Now, what I want you to see is the first two words. I hope. I hope. Indeed, I do hope that that's where you are on your pilgrim journey. I do hope that you understand the importance of, of being grafted into God. Of being that vine on that branch on that, on that vine of life. I hope that's where you are. But the thing is, I know full well that some of you are not there. I know full well that for some of you that is not where you are in your faith journey. And for some of you, you're not there in your faith journey because, because you're being dragged down by, by events in the past. Some of them a short time ago, others way back down the line. Listen, friends. You cannot look forward and backward at the same time. You can't do it. You cannot look forward and backward at the same time. God's on a journey. He's moving on. Do not let yourself be tied down to past events. You've got to let the Holy Spirit cut those chains that are binding you so that you can pick up the step and you can walk with the man from Galilee. You see? Everywhere I turn, I'm talking to people who are, and in, you, you can't talk to people very long before that coronavirus comes up. It's been the main topic of conversation for 12 months now. And for some of us, that, that looms as this giant cloud that's out there, and it dominates our, our every thought, see? It's become the top concern in the lives of many, many people, maybe in your life. But let me tell you, friends, the coronavirus is far from being the top concern in the lives of many, many people these days. On my personal prayer list right now are folks whose journey has taken them through the valleys of bankruptcy, divorce, cancer, unemployment, 
miscarriage, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's, and many, many more causes of pain and suffering for which there is no vaccine on the horizon. Those folks who, who seem to be at peace on this difficult leg in their journey are those who seem to have their eyes fixed on God. And, and they've, they have adopted an attitude akin to that of, of a man named Charles Spurgeon. Some of you may know that Charles Spurgeon was England's great 19th century preacher. What you may not know is that Charles Spurgeon battled anxiety and depression all of his adult life. Spurgeon said, I've learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. I've learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. I understand those words to mean that that Spurgeon had not only come to grips with his, with his maladies, but he'd come to, he'd come to see his anxiety and, and, and depression as, as catalysts, as, as things that, that moved him to depend more on God, to rely more on his provision, to, to, to rely more on his presence, because he was up against things he couldn't fix himself, see? What do you do when you find yourself in a hole and you can't get out? Doesn't it cause you to look up? Doesn't it cause you to to consider the power of God to fill that hole in and get you up and rolled again? I know a lot of y'all here today are catching hell in one way or another. I think what Spurgeon would say is, thank the Lord for the hell you're going through. Realize he's at work in the midst of your mess to draw you closer to him, to cause you to depend more on him, see. Now, it's not easy, I know, to see the, the different things that are buffeting us one way or another. It's, it's not easy to, to see those different twists and turns as a straight road that leads us to Christ. But I'm on a journey. That's where I want my journey to end, and I pray that's where you want yours to end. And if the twists and turns of what it takes to bring me to Jesus and to bring you to Jesus, then, hey, I'm rejoicing in the twists and the turns. We close with this thought. There's an old Jewish saying, the day is short, the work is great. It is not your duty to complete the work, but neither are you free to desist from it. The day is short. The work is great. It is not your duty to complete the work, but neither are you free to desist from it. As we return to to our altar today, as we return to, to our Bethel today, I urge you to remember that the great work that Abraham undertook only began to be completed 2,000 years later with the coming of Jesus Christ. And like Abraham, God has set a great work before you, a great work before me. And the great work that God has put before us is so great, it's not going to be completed in this year. Indeed, it's not going to be created, completed this side of glory. And what is the great work that God has put before you and put before me? Dear ones, I believe it's the same great work that he put before Charles Spurgeon. You see, as Spurgeon drew closer to Christ, he drew others to Christ with him. As you draw closer to Christ, the great work before you is to draw others to Christ with you. Now, we're starting, we're in the first part of the second month of a new year. But you know, basically, you and I are the same people we were 
when we ended last year as we come here this morning. We're drawn together today mostly because we're filled with the same kinds of hurts, same kinds of needs, and indeed the same kinds of dreams. We've come just as we are to Jesus. Not to get a, a quick blessing as he, as he passes by, but to join him, just as Andrew and Peter did, to join him on a, on a transformational journey, a transformational journey leading to the gospel transformation of, of many others. And we understand that life is a precious gift from God. And it's not to be squandered. We know the day is short. We're not going to live forever. We know the day is short. And we know the work that God has put before us is great. It's great. Our lives are not just about us and him. No. That's what Andrew and Peter's eyes were open to see. I want you to journey with me, fellas. I'll make you fishers of men. And I want you to be about the business of fishing for men and fishing for women. That's what God wants us to do. That's what he calls Spurgeon to do. And given that our time on this earth is short and that work is great, we pray together today that, that the Holy Spirit would fill us with the power necessary to be about that business. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, there's so much going on, so many adjectives and things flipping around in our, in our heads, and we are filled with, with dreams and dreads and with anticipation and, and with this sense of, at the same time, this, this sense of apprehension. I know we're filled with those kinds of mixed emotions because we... We're in some timey in our faith in you, and we praise your name that you're not some timey in, in your love for us. You put before us a, a great work. Abraham never saw that work completed. He never saw the Christ. He didn't know about Calvary. He might have discerned in some way that you're going to act in a, in a mighty, mighty way to, to change the course of humanity. But he never saw it. Lord, we've seen the pictures. We've, we've read the texts. We know the story. We know and have proof of your great love for us. Lord, give us the power to respond loving you in the way you would have us to love you by loving others in your name, by bringing others into your family, by journeying with you. Come, Lord Jesus, in the power of your Holy Spirit, use us in a mighty, mighty way. As we leave today, take our feet to someone who does not know you and give us the courage to say a word for you. In your name we do pray, Lord. Amen. And